Thanks for watching online today. This week we continue the study in the book of Colossians. Today is Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23. History tells us of soldiers who continued to fight after a war had been settled and treaty signed. Some ignored messages about treaties. Others just simply were never told. They were fighting for something that had already been settled. Some of the Colossian believers that we're going to read about today were fighting a war that had already been settled as well. False teachers within the church were trying to convince them they needed more than faith in Jesus to have a true relationship with God. And choosing to follow certain legalistic practices, they were trying to fight this battle Jesus had already won. Now I want to ask you these questions, two questions just to start th- get us to think this today. What do you think makes it hard for some people to accept the idea that salvation comes through faith in Christ alone? Second question is this. Why do you think some people try to add requirements beyond faith in Jesus for getting favor from God? This is what the false teachers were doing within the church. They were adding other requirements to earn favor with God. And so Paul comes along in the book of Colossians and he confronts this topic in his writing to the Colossians. Let's look at back a little bit of what Paul had already written to them earlier in the book. In Colossians 2.8, Paul encourages the Colossians in this idea of the philosophy, the philosophy. Verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And then Paul comes back and presents the sufficiency of Christ in Colossians 2, 12 through 14. He says this in verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you once, uh, you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And now Paul comes back and to refute this heresy that was being taught by some in this church that was affecting specifically three areas. Number one was their freedom in worship. Number two was the freedom from falsehoods. And number three was their freedom to live. So let's go back and look at, and I'm just going to read Colossians 2, 16, verses 16 through 23, and then we're going to come back and unpack uh, a little bit of this. Verse 16, Colossians chapter 2. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels and going on in details about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through uh, through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Verse 20, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why? As if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not touch, touch, excuse me, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to the things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, let's unpack this a little bit. The first area that Paul felt like they were being uh, affected by was their freedom in worship. It was affecting their freedom in worship. Let's go back to verses 16 and 17. Paul starts out verse 16 by saying, therefore. And by the way, he's saying therefore, which he's referring to what he just talked about, which was the sufficiency in Christ. So it's like, therefore, since there's sufficiency in Christ, Let no one pass judgment on um, you in questions of food and drink 
or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The false teachers were giving a list of things that the Colossians were supposed to do to earn favor with God. It was legalism. It was this. It was Christ. In other words, your relationship with Christ. It was Christ plus human works equals your favor from God, your favor of God, your salvation. It was, it was to have a set of external standards or rituals. The false teachers were telling the Colossians they need to do more. So Paul comes back and mentions four specific areas in these verses, and specifically verse 16, that is being affected. Number one is to be obedient in the food they ate and what they drank. The prohibitions were probably coming from the Old Testament dietary laws, Leviticus 11. Those laws were set for the people of Israel in the Old Testament to encourage them not to intermingle with the nations surrounding them. It was showing them that they are set apart. They got, they're chosen. They were set apart. They were different. But see, the Colossians were not under the Old Testament. They were under the New Testament, the New Covenant. But they were being told it was Jesus plus something else. And that's what they had to do. So this one, it was specifically Jesus plus, hey, what you eat and drink determines your favor of God, from God. Number two was this, the, to attend certain festivals. They were told you need to attend certain festivals. These festivals were annual Jewish celebrations such as the Passover, Pentecost, or the Feast of Tabernacles. They were being told you need to attend these festivals as well. Uh, number three was to make sacrifices. It talks about the new moon. Um, at the first day of the month, they were supposed to make sacrifices. So, so far it was like Jesus plus what you eat and drink, Jesus plus the festivals, Jesus plus the sacrifices, and finally, they were talking about to worship on the Sabbath. They were saying you need to worship on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. They were to worship on Saturday like they did in the Old Testament. Again, these were all Old Testament practices. And Paul was telling the church, do not sacrifice your freedom in worship specifically for a set of rules that only applied in the Old Testament. So what did Paul say there in verse 16? He said, let no one judge you on these things because, verse 17, these rituals are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The Old Testament laws were a mere shadow of things to come. These laws were a precursor of Jesus Christ, and we know that. It was Jesus Christ who perfectly embodied it. Jesus Christ is the reality to which the shadows pointed. How do you think, let me ask you this, how do you think legalism, or having these set of rituals, gets in the way of true worship? Think about that. Rituals. Um, how do they, in, the, in legalism that sometimes we feel like is placed in our life, how does that get in the way of true worship? worship. Well, it could be the way you view coming to church on Sunday. So think about this. Why do you come to church? Is it for status? Is it the thought that God will be uh, happy with me if I come to church? Is it because you were just told growing up, hey, this is the right thing to do and you're just supposed to go to church on Sundays? You may be coming to church because of those things or maybe some other reasons. Let me encourage you with this. Coming to church with the mindset of, I am here to worship Jesus Christ for who he is and what he has done. That's how you should come to church, with that mindset. And parents, let me encourage you with this. And let me ask you this if you're a parent. How do you think your children view coming to church? Why, why, in their minds, what, what are they thinking? Like, why are we coming to church, mom, dad? Why are we coming? You see, we need to show our children that coming to church is more than just because it's the right thing to do. It's because we're here to worship. That's what we need to continue to encourage our children with. This is why we're coming to church. Come ready on Sunday morning to enjoy the freedom to worship because of Christ and Christ alone. Second area that was being affected by false teachers was this. Their freedom from falsehoods. Let's go back to the scripture in verse 18 and 19 of chapter 2. Let no one disqualify or condemn some versions of the Bible say condemn or keep defrauding you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by sensuous mind. 
Verse 19, and now not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. The false teachers were promoting kind of a mysticism, the pursuit, which is the pursuit of a deeper or higher subjective religious experience. The false teachers claimed like they had a mystical union with God. It was kind of, uh, it was really apart from human intellect and natural senses. They were claiming to be higher than the other believers. It's like they were set aside. They were, they had this relationship with God that was very mystic. Paul writes and comes back and says in verse 18, let no one disqualify you or condemn you. And he's talking about the mystics who were trying to be the spiritual referees by disqualifying the believers. It was them saying, listen, you're going to be condemned if you do not abide by our set of rules. And that's what the, the, the people, the believers in the church, they were hearing and thinking. They were scared to be that they were disqualified in their relationship with God. But Paul encouraged them not to let these false teachers condemn them because they were not to follow them. Paul warned against several falsehoods of mysticism threatening the Colossian church. Number one was this, the ascetic practices, the ascetic practices. Verse 18, they were insisting on asceticism. An ascetic is one who lives a life, life of rigorous self-denial, which was really a, a false humility. They were teaching that it is a part of the righteousness of God in your life and that you were to live with this life of self-denial. And that kind of made you to where, if I live this life of self-denial, I have the righteousness of God. Again, it's that extra, that something you had to do. Now, we do know the importance of self-denial as a believer. Uh, many believers, especially missionaries, by necessity, live a life of self-denial. Nothing's wrong with that. But, but believers do not do this. They do not, and we do not live a life of self-denial for God's approval. The false teachers were living this life and promoting it to gain approval from God. That's what was happening. So that was the first falsehood. Second falsehood was this, the worship of angels, which was even worse. This was heresy. The Bible strictly forbids the worship of angels. It was denying the truth that it says in Scripture, one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Third falsehood was this, false teachers would share about the visions they had. You ever had somebody tell you a vision they had and they felt like it was from God? Well, this is where you got to be careful because they were saying this. In verse 18, Paul says, they were insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions. It was like extra biblical revelations. Paul was saying, you got to be careful with that. And then Paul, after all of that, he says, he describes these false teachers as verse 18 that they're puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, basically a fleshly mind. They were devoid of the Holy Spirit. They had gone beyond the teaching of Christ. And so in Paul, uh, what Paul says in verse 19 about them, he says, they were not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. The false teachers were not holding exclusively as Christ, onto Christ as the head. As a consequence, if you really think about this, they were undernourished spiritually. They believed themselves to be the spiritual experts in a class all by themselves. They were not abiding and thus lacked a vital relationship with Christ Jesus. Christ alone is the head of the true spiritual body, and this is what Paul's talking about, the church. And even in Colossians 1, Paul talks about this, about Christ. He says in verse 17 of chapter 1 of Colossians, and he is before all things, meaning Christ. And in, in him, all things hold together. And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. It is from the divine head that the body is nourished. Furthermore, listen to this, it is... It is the divine head by which the body is held together. Talking about the church. Listen to this. Like the ligaments and tendons that keep a physical human body properly joined and functioning, so Christ keeps his spiritual body, the church, 
joined in unity and functioning with growth from God. You see, spiritual growth, our spiritual growth comes from union with Christ, nothing else. This is why in John 15, verses 4 through 5, Jesus says this, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear much uh, bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I am in him, he is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's that abiding in Christ. And Paul was basically saying, listen, these false teachers are not abiding in Christ. They are far from Christ. Finally, the third area that was being affected was just their freedom to live. So let's go back to Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish as they are used, according to the human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You see, these false teachers focus their attention on things one should do and should not do. I mean, they said, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And Paul comes back and says, it looks like wisdom. And it might even make a person look spiritual. But it really only served to gratify the flesh. It is an attempt by these people to look more holy than others. So... Our justification, our status before God, our life, our freedom is found only in Christ. His life, his death, and his resurrection. Now I want you to do this and kind of some application here. Taking this scripture, taking this passage where Paul writes to the, to the Colossians. Look at your own life. What are some things you may be trying to do to gain salvation? What are some things you're, you're adding in your life, to your life, where you think, hey, you know, this, this can help me gain a little bit more favor from God? Are you trying to earn God's favor? Maybe by this, by going to church. Maybe by reading the Bible and praying. Maybe by just being a good person. And you believe, hey, if I do this stuff, God will love me and approve me, and I'll find favor in God's eyes? Or do you understand that your approval from God comes from your faith, your trust, your belief in Jesus Christ alone? His life, death, and resurrection, and because of Christ, you do this. You come to worship him. You read your Bible because you want to learn. You pray because you want to have communion with God. And you seek to honor God with your life because he is Lord of your life. This is the freedom we have in Christ. Let me pray. Father in heaven, as we, in, even in our society today, feel the pressure sometimes to do things to earn favor from you, I pray that we will understand as believers that Christ earned our favor through his life, his death, his resurrection. And I pray as believers we will live a life of freedom as we worship and as we live our life daily in Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen.